parked in a barn. He's saying they parked in a barn. Have you ever seen one that was parked in a barn? You ever talk about something? Get a car that was parked in a barn and they uh, put a battery in it and jumped it out, jumped it off, and or maybe put it, jumped it off or put a battery in it and drove it out of there and they had them a really nice barn vehicle. Have you seen that before? No. You see on the internet where people found some super muscle hot rod car in a barn somewhere. And, a, a real heavy duty van. Yeah, maybe on the internet. Well, this one right here, let's solve this engine performance problem. This is an engine performance problem. You need to pay close attention to what you're seeing here. Okay. The throttle position sensor on this 98 Chevy pickup reads zero volts at all three terminals. It's not supposed to read zero volts at all three terminals, is it? No. Jonathan needs to come on in here. Where is that? Jonathan! All right, so. So the TP sensor disconnected and the engine uh, on not running, uh, TP sensor terminal B reads ground. Now we took the TP sensor off. We took it out of there. We measured the ground right here. So on B we're getting the ground. All right, you might notice that's signal return or GM calls it sensor ground, okay? So we basically got that going on here. With the key on, a reading is taken at pin 24 on C2. And there's a little bit about terminal A and C, by the way, uh, terminals A and C do not have voltage. No voltage in terminal A and C. So we do have a ground here, but we have no voltage here, which should be 5 volt reference, and we have no voltage here, which is a signal. Basically, it typically won't have any voltage until the TP feeds you know, voltage to it. So, we've got ground here. What's this, Jonathan? We've got ground here, and we got no, no 5 volt reference here. Okay? All right, so with the key still on, the read is taken at pin 24 on C2. All right, let's get rid of that and that. Come on, get rid of the arrows. All right, see that? Pin C, excuse me, 24 on C2. Now, this is the same box, actually, top and bottom. Okay, 24, uh, you got no voltage there. A read is taken on pin 12 at C3, and there's no voltage there. Uh, reading is taken on pins 23 at C2 and 4.6 is present. See, we're checking that one too. And we're, we found some voltage there. We got voltage here, but we don't have any voltage here. So what conclusion can you draw from these tests? One of these is the right answer. If you've got voltage coming out of that one, but you ain't got no voltage coming out, of that one, and this is not shorted to ground, what's wrong? Somebody talk to me. If you have voltage coming out here, but you don't have voltage coming out there, and you're supposed to have, what's the problem? Well, actually, you're not dreadfully far off, but these are both the same box. They just drew up this way because they had to make it work like that. Notice how the box is dotted, but both of them the same box. It basically comes around. So, when you, what did you say? Did you say B or what? I said B. Okay. Said e? You're, no, D is going to be the right one. Uh, That's a false E vehicle, you know. Uh, you said D, right? The right yeah. one? Yeah, D is the right one. So, you weren't dreadfully wrong, but there's only one VCM here, okay? And it's just, I was a little bit confused. That was a kind of a trick question. Well, this colleague of mine called me a couple of years back about a VW Beetle she drove in high school. Okay, it was sitting in a barn. Uh, or a property, she got all excited about getting it going again. If you knew, my dad used to run a Volkswagen shop. I had my uncle Earl stand there in my dad's Volkswagen shop in 1968 drinking coffee. All right, so somebody couldn't do better. Uh, you know, you could buy a Volkswagen brand spanking new for less than $2,000 and drive it for a while. Now, the bad thing about a Volkswagen bug is it didn't have an oil filter on it. You had to change oil every 1,500 miles. You had to do frequent valve and brake adjustments on it. There's all kinds of maintenance the thing required. Uh, but now if you see one sitting beside the road somebody's trying to sell, they want five, six thousand dollars for it. You know, it's ridiculous. You know, I don't know how many I bought for a hundred bucks. <laughs> so she figured her and her husband were gonna roll that old bug out of the barn, put a battery in it, drive it away. But I told her, I says, everything on that thing's gonna be locked up. Most likely. You know, it's not a guarantee, but I said, I imagine all of the uh, everything except the steering box is going to be seized up on it, including the engine. Because it's been sitting there all along with all this condensation going in and out and all that. And so it turned out, everything except the steering box was locked up. That's just because it was sealed the fall. All right. 
I bought this dune buggy for $100 while I was still in high school. My dad stuffed an engine in it. And I drove it all over the countryside, jumping terraces and everything else. All kinds of fun with that thing. That's my brother and my sister in there. And uh, this guy came driving by, a guy named Steve Tucker. He just pulled up. I didn't know the guy. He says, how much you take for that orange buggy sitting there? And so I called my dad. I said, what should I ask you for the orange buggy? He said, you make, you make the price. It's yours. And so I hung up the phone. I went back out there and I says, It'll take about four hundred dollars. I didn't have about a hundred dollars invested in it, <laughs> and so we built about four four hundred dollar bills and drove away on my buggy. Or actually, came back and got it. And I said, I wish I hadn't sold that thing. I could have sold it and it for sale. You know, I mean, I was really having fun with that thing until he bought it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyhow, I had a seventy Ford pickup, uh, an old seventy model Ford pickup. I purchased and drove uh, from a guy that had found it sitting in a barn, and he put a battery in it, got a tag for it, drove it for a few months, sold it to me for I don't know five six hundred dollars. And I later sold it to somebody else. But it ran good, even though it was junky. Well, you know, always finding these vehicles that in the barn is pretty good. This 53 Ford belonged to the grandmother or a friend of mine. Now, at the time, the car was only 19 years old. But when we dragged that thing out of the garage and we hooked it behind another car and put it in second gear, you know, had three on the tree, and uh, that thing fired up. It had been sitting there for two or three years. I mean, amazing to me that back in those days, the gas didn't seem to go rotten as bad as it does nowadays. A long way or another, we got that thing started. And it was a 1953 Ford commemorative model. It looked about like that one right there, except it was a darker color green. I found that picture on the other day. All right, now this nice looking parked in a barn truck. This one came out of a barn. And somebody had died. They brought brought his truck out of the barn. And, uh, it was not, you know, doing like it's supposed to. It wouldn't do anything but idle. And this is a 4.8 liter engine. Uh, and this is a nice looking truck. They even washed it before they got over to it. That look familiar to anybody? Yeah. What's he saying? Did I work on it? <laughs> I told you he's gonna remember that because he worked on it. Alright. So, now he's looking parked in the barn truck. Barn for years. And it was also reported to have rat damage. It was started, but all it did was idle, and it didn't do that very well. It idled, but it didn't idle worth a flip. There was a reduced engine power message on the cluster and there was no throttle response. The rat damage we found on the first pass from this all it did was the tube was an oxensor wiring, you know, go around the back. I ain't gonna make it do that. Right. So some of these critter damage, these vehicles got been driven every day, but still suffer critter damage. Now this one lady lived there close to a cotton field in Andalusia, and the rats were always getting under the hood of her explorer eating the injector wires and stuff. So she put rat poison there. And uh, that mitigated that a little bit. Was that uh, there was cotton and everything that a lot of times they bring cotton from a cotton field and they build a nest under the <laughs> under the hood of a vehicle. This one guy was working uh, when I was at the Ford place over he opened the hood on his Bronco too. And there were big old rats down on top of the engine looking at me. Golly. And this rat, you know, scampered off somewhere. He didn't see where he went or nothing, you know, and he said, Well I guess he's probably okay, you know. You know, so anyway, he was trying to get down here and find his oxygen sensor ground, you know, still wondering where the rat was. And this guy came walking by and reached over the tire and started making stuff on his hand. <laughs> he like had a heart attack. All that rat was eating. Anyway. I hate when people do that. Yeah, but uh, this was a, they do that a lot to girls too. Okay, yes. this was a bird nest on a '91 Cavalier. I worked on one Friday. See the bird nest? Open the hood. There it was. Uh, that was Alan Cobb's nephew's car, and uh, we had to put an ignition module stuff in it. But anyway, uh, he uh, there's eggs in there uh, now. Who remembers seeing a bird nest on one of our college vehicles about a month ago? That Chevrolet Avalanche, that 07 Avalanche that we got right down there laying against a manifold. And that truck gets driven just about every day. But that thing laying against a manifold was a great big old bird nest. I'm talking about if the manifold got hot, it would catch fire. I'm surprised it didn't because it was laying right against that manifold. I know, I that truck wasn't sitting in a barn. Right? Uh, this guy, Jimmy, that works over the Ford, he had a, a vehicle that he had worked on less than five miles on the odometer, hadn't even been through the pre-delivery, but the knock sets or harness wires had been chewed by rats on a brand new vehicle. All right, so the rattling trailblazer water pump comes in, and with a leaky radiator, a rattling noise turned out to be a bad water pump. And a six millimeter bolt can't handle the torque of a new 3 8 air ratchet, okay? That's a six millimeter bolt with a little 10 millimeter head on it. And that boy was working on it, just pop that bolt off smooth. Well, got the radiator out of the way, grill out of the way, put it to work, drilling it out. 
And even with another guy helping him, all I could do was complain the drill bits I provided weren't hard enough to drill into that boat. You remember that? And they whined and they belly ached and they cried about it and couldn't get it to work. And so I told them, I said, don't spin the drill bit too fast because if you do that, you heat the drill bit and the bolt up, the bolt gets harder and the drill bit gets softer and it quits cutting anything and then you're frustrated. So I got an old three, Makita 3-H three drill. They cried and walked away. So I got a stool after they, they, had, they were half day guys in so they went to work. I got a stool and sat down with the same drill bit, the same drill, drilled into that thing, got a screw extractor, screwed it out with my fingers. And then I sent a text message to uh, one of them and saying, this is how you get this thing out. And they said, you used a different drill bit. You gave us a sorry drill bit. This was a brand new titanium drill bit. <laughs> they just didn't have the grit. They didn't need a better drill bit. They just needed more grit. This is not for wussy boys or girls, is it? Is it? You, know, it. you remember yeah. last semester you had to do all that grinding to get that A-frame out from under there? That was a nasty business, wasn't it? Everything's all seized up. And, um, I mean, anyway, I just... It's really irritating when you're trying to do something real simple like an alignment, the bolts you're having to turn it goes pop and snaps off and you can't leave it like that, you know. Anyway, oh, discovery on the reduced power. Go back to the Silverado. My guy, that's him, discovered the throttle control module is offline no matter, uh, no wonder the throttle moves. So the throttle control module hangs right here on those. And what used to hang there before they had a throttle control module? Do you remember? This is right in front of the driver. There's something else that used to be there. But it was no longer needed when you wound up with this throttle control module because it's a drive-by-wire system. Cruise control module used to hang right there. And it was almost, it was a little fatter than that, but it, it, it actually did, technically did the same job except only when a cruise was on it. And a cable going over there. All right, that's why that, you know, it's just a little similar to that green truck we got out there, but that one doesn't have electronic throttle body. Now here's your throttle body motor. That's what it looks like on the inside, you know, and all that. Incidentally, on electronic throttle bodies, that thing is driving the throttle plate open and closed. It doesn't let spring pressure do anything, except whenever thing stops, it goes back. But, I mean, the throttle, that throttle might be driving it both ways. So Ford adopted the faster process at Black Oak PCM before they went to the electronic throttle control. The GM actually put a, a standalone module to handle it because it's, it's got to operate instantaneously and the engine controllers that GM was using back then wouldn't handle that job, so they had to put a separate module in there. Put a little Delphi unit, a little smart box. All right, so there's your old Delphi engine controller. And here's the little throttle controller. You got your, this plugs into that. And then this other connector here is the one we're concerned with. And, uh, all right, it takes input from three redundant accelerator pedal sensors. Right? Why, why do they have three sensors on it, you think? Why do they, they got three redundant sensors? What do you suppose? Idle, reverse, drive. <laughs> Actually, they got three so that they can make dog going sure that it's dependable signal. If they got one signal and it fails, you know, the truck runs away, you see it's going to be looking at all three. It's not likely three of them going to fail at the same time. Some have just two. But, you know, you know the old Power Stroke Diesel's first one that I saw back in the early 90s, and the uh, early Power Strokes had an idle validation switch and an accelerator pedal sensor that were built on there. You didn't just replace those sensors though, you replaced the whole uh, pedal uh, if you had to do that. So yeah, you got a redundant pair of potentiometers and it talks to the PCM via the, this UART link. Uh, you know, so this talks to that. Uh, but one way or another, uh, when the ETC uh, you know, fuse blown to smithereens in the junction box, this would, this would pop. And we and put a new fuse in there and powered it back up, pop that fuse right there. You know how hard it is to catch a fuse as it's blowing with your camera when you're taking a picture? That is the actual fuse blowing on that truck. So how did I do that? Walk. I took a video and framed it ahead until I found the <laughs> blown fuse spot and did a screenshot what I did. Uh, could this be a result of rat damage? Now think about this. It comes to us with rat damage and it won't do anything but idle. What are you thinking? The rats have chewed some wires somewhere that have caused this. That's what you're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it, it, it would follow. It would be, it would be logitatos that it would be that, right? So, or, or logical, rather. All right, so here we go. So, uh, well, one power and one ground is what we found in there. That one and that one. Pin six is not shown on this schematic. But what we've also found, when we were checking, we found a ground on pin six. Um, excuse me. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, that one, not this one. Anyway, that one right there would also show up round, but it would disappear when we hit the break. Remember that? Okay, so, so whenever we uh, tarred wire to ground pin set and receives power from the fuse, and it would immediately pop with the module plugged in, but would remain not, if you disconnected the module, it wouldn't blow the fuse. All right, and I pointed actually, that I made my arrow point, that's pin eight, I think pin eight, pin six is that arrow, let me point that pin right there. All right, so right here is pin six on the throttle actuator module. Stop lamps are five voltage. And I was reading the ground here, and that ground was coming from these stop lamps. Listen to this, this is really important. On cruise control, pick that. On cruise control, the, um, the stop lamps and in other words, a cruise control module or this thing here couldn't care less about voltage going to the stop lamps. It ain't looking at that. It's looking at the ground coming through the stop lap bulbs. So if you blow all your stop lap bulbs, you won't have cruise. You got that? If all your stop lap bulbs are blown, typically you won't have cruise. Even on this one here. All right. So that's what that was about. So we ignored that one. That one is not going to be a fuse blowing proposition right here. All right. Come on. All right, there weren't any other grounds leading to the C1 connector. And the short went away with the box unplugged. The box had to be internally shorted. Why that happened while the truck was in a barn is kind of mysterious. We didn't see any physical damage or no rat chewing or anything like that. That's what the little box looks like. Got little chips on it and all that. You can tell there's some pretty sophisticated electronics there. All right, so I went by the salvage yard on the way home, snagged the used replacement box for 30 bucks. Now that solved the reduced power message and the non-responsive throttle issue, but the truck still ran terrible. It would rev up, but it was running bad. And we intended to find out why. Well, some hidden rat damage maybe still? Maybe we're still looking for rats? All right. We had a misfire on six, and a set of spark plugs didn't change a doggone thing. They didn't cost much. Put them in there. Didn't do nothing. Every cylinder was bouncing around 120. That's a little bit low, but they're all even, and 120 is enough to start the truck. Okay? Now, if you had 120, 120, 120, 60, 120, 120, you'd have issues. All right, so six never hit a lick at any speed when the engine was running. It was always counting up. So swapping coils didn't move misfire. We swap coils around, didn't move misfire that way. The main old cylinder six didn't take smoke tests, didn't give us anything in the way of a leak, so we didn't have a vacuum leak. A dynamic compression test might have been a good idea, but we decided to do one more test before we went that far. And we used our electronic fuel injector tester. You guys have seen this thing. Some of you have used it, right? All right, time to do an injector flow comparison. The rats weren't as much of a problem as we thought they would be. They only chewed two wires on this one, and it turned out we had one clogged injector. Right? So we got an injector, and we wound up finding that we put an injector on it. $80 later, after the injector, it would run a really smooth. So we put those nozzles on there. Now what would this cause right here? Bad connection. What is this component I'm holding in my hand? Like a coil. That's a coil. It would, and a bad connection is a not a bad answer, but it caused a misfire. And it seems to me like it was on this truck where we had that. We had unplugged the coil. Because we swapped coils back and forth, you remember that? Yeah. And we wound up. This confused us even more because it created a misfire because the coil wasn't plugged. I mean, you know, that pin there wasn't making a connection. So that's something to look at too. Anytime you got any doubt, you remember all that one, uh, that truck we were working on that we put the transmission in and I was looking in there with, a, with my little camera on my phone to see if those pins were bent. I mean, it's always something you need to look at. Pin whether they're bent and if they fit right. You know, that, that one GM instructor I was talking about how if you unplug and plug together a GM connectors four times, you're going to start having trouble with them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was a, Del, a, Del, a Delco instructor, you know, GM guy. All right, here you go. Here's a little trick. On some Hondas and Toyotas, this damper, and it's not very big, it's only about this big around, by the way. It's got that screw in the middle of it. If you switch on the key and you see that screw move, you know you got enough fuel pressure where it ought to start. That's all you need to know. As a matter of fact, I went by the Toyota place one day and told those guys about that because I saw one of them working on one that had one of these. I said, did you know you can look at that screw and tell if you got fuel pressure? These were dealership mechanics. They said, no, I didn't know that. You know, 
But I mean, Lexus, Toyota, some Hondas, they got that fuel pressure regulator right there. And so it'll actually move, that little screw moves. It'll look like that when you don't have pressure, it'll look like that when you do. Remember that. It might make you, you know, you can, if you imagine yourself walking up here and you got a no start and somebody's trying to spin it over and you're happen to be looking at that thing and they don't even know you're looking at it. Sometimes you got to pull a plastic cap out of the way and you look at it and you say, uh, you got no fuel pressure. And they say, how do you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? I was training a boy one time and we went out to this car. This is a funny story. And he said, uh, he was watching me real close to see how I did everything. And there was a recall on some of these tempos that if you had a, you could tell if the engine controller was one of the ones that needed to be replaced because the ones that needed to be replaced had cooling fins on the side of the engine controller. And the one that you put on there to replace it didn't have. The cooling fins weren't the real issue, but that's how you identified it. And so we went out there and I looked at my work order. He was following, watching me real close. And I laid down on one knee and got in there and felt the engine controller. And I said, yeah, listen, here's going to have an engine controller. Goes, oh, he feels in the engine controller. And how am I supposed to learn how to do this? <laughs> of course, then I had to explain to him I was feeling for cooling fins. Uh, people think you're smarter than you are sometimes if you just don't tell them. All right, so the 2007 expedition came in with some pretty serious misfire. He wanted a fuel pump replaced before we did anything else. Remember that red one? Uh, he fared more or less like mine. We'd replaced the spark plug uh, years ago, so I was surprised if I didn't need another set. Anyway, we buzz those out. We snatch the things out with an impact wrench. You can get them right out of there. You know, I was talking to some of these guys are terrified of these spark plugs because about half of them usually come apart. And I would say, well, pull it out with an impact wrench. He said, oh, you're going to do that. I said, well, what you got to lose, man? I said, half of them are coming apart anyway. We ain't never had one come apart, pull apart with the impact wrench. And another guy uh, emailed me, and he said, man, I did away with my tools that I was using to pull these, to retract these, because I don't need them anymore when I started using an impact wrench to get them out. Yeah. All right, so the leaking shock absorber, that same one. Now, let me ask you this. You can tell that shock absorber just started leaking. That was on that same vehicle, right? It just started leaking. So why would that shock absorber just start leaking while we were working on it? Got any idea? You suppose it might have something to do that when we jacked it up, it overextended it? I mean, it didn't extend it any more than it should have been, but that triggered the leak. And so uh, we had to put him on that one. He only wanted that one because he won't spend a lot of money. All right, so let's see what you know. There are random questions here. What does this spark plug tell you? Yeah, what are y'all saying? It's not suited properly because it's uh, got rust on it. I got a, if there's a consensus, we got coolant getting in that cylinder. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. If you pull it out, if it's got a misfire, if it's got, if it's drinking coolant, imagine it says I keep having to add coolant, but it ain't going on the ground. I don't see any steam coming out the pipe but you may not pull all the plugs out if one of them really rusty like that, that one is getting coolant typically. That's a really, really strong indicator that coolant's on there. That came out of that little white Toyota that we, you know, we're working on. All right, what's this spark plug tell you? And what might have caused this problem? There's an oil on the back of the spark plug. So no, that's, no, that's, that's not it. Yeah. That's natural. That. That's right, but I mean, look at the whole, look at the overall picture. Uh, sparks. Yeah, the spark track going down the side of it. First time I saw that was on a 91 Explorer, and it didn't seem to happen on the ones that had a distributor, but when they started putting coil on plug, which had a lot more, you know, like 110,000 volts, you know, this kind of, uh, if that plug built way too much resistance or was burned up sort of, it would start jumping down the side. And it will make a track inside the wire, and if you don't replace the wire, in spite of the fact that you put new plugs in it, that track is going to be an easy path for current, and it's going to track a new plug and it'll come back on you. So make darn sure if it's got, you know, boots on a coil on plug coil or if it's, you know, or you're going to put a plug wires on there with it. Plug wires and a plug. All right. What does this black cloud mean? What do you think when you see a black cloud like that coming out of the tailpipe? Yeah, uh, cow that can't hurt it. No. <laughs> huh? What is that? No, it's not a diesel, that's a gas burner. It's actually, that is uh, hydrocarbon soot, is what that is. And when you see that, you know it's running rich. So that's, a, that's a rich running vehicle. All right. Which one of these is the correct cam timing mark for a 98 2.2 liter camera? Camry, that one or that one? 
Huh? Number two. Number two. That one there looks like it would be, don't it? That looks new, though. Well, somebody painted it. What an announcement. What's this? It's obviously under the hood of the car. Right there by the air filter. Got 10 wires going to it. Got a cable coming off of it. Everybody looks, but they don't see. Air sense or pulling the air? No, it basically doesn't have anything to do with this filter. I just kind of give you an idea that's what it was. And right now there's the transmission range sensor. Remember what I will tell you. That is an electronic cruise control module on a Ford. Okay? You got that? Electronic cruise control module. Everybody hear that? That's the end of the show. All right. You get anything out of that? You like that? Feel like being the star of the show?